G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and today we're going to be having a look at a second part of a workflow we started earlier this week um, where we look at trying to use Rhino Insight to assess the formwork associated to each element in a model. Now we're currently at the point where we have our model available in Rhino for analysis um, so you might want to check out my GitHub where I've got the files available to use um, to get you to this point. But we're going to use some intersection techniques in this case in order to find all the uh, surface areas that are exposed. So if a surface area overlaps with another one we're going to join it together using a union um, so you won't treat this area as formed because obviously if it's inside an intersection there's no formwork. Um, but we're going to associate these areas back to their associated elements so if it clashes with a beam or a column or a floor that that area is going to be, be part of that floor and we're going to send that data back to Dynamo, uh, back to Revit sorry, uh, not Dynamo, um, so that we can tally the, the, the formwork associated to types of elements or per level, um, handy little workflow. Anyway, let's jump in. So in our previous part we looked at baking all the elements into Rhino by layer and they also have in this case their element ID as their name so we can back reference the data associated to this geometry to this corresponding element in Revit itself. So we're now going to deal with analysing the formwork associated with these elements. So we're going to find all surfaces that are exposed that are pointing at least sideways and downwards. So things that would need to have a formed edge or underlying surface. We're going to ignore anything pointing up because obviously gravity means that we don't have to form those typically. Um, you can obviously modify what you're looking at. You might just want to look at downward facing surfaces. Um, but in this case, we're just going to use the normal of each surface to analyze whether it's valid for formwork or not. So to begin with, I'm just going to open Grasshopper again. And we're going to be looking in this case at some geometry. So what I might do is just put this off to the side so we can see what's going on. And I might even, um, I might even just turn everything off so that we see geometry preview. So I currently have default layer on, so I only see default. And I'll just make this a little bit smaller. Cool. So I'm going to make a new script and I'm just going to save it. And I'm just going to call this demo2. Okay, so to begin with, we actually need to get all the elements in the model, join them into one big solid component. And then we're actually just going to go and use that um, to, to effectively um, set our elements. I just had a little preview that's, um, that's changed, so I'll just fix that. Maybe you have a script off to the side that sort of helps me out. Uh, for some reason, it's not playing ball. There we go. Anyway, um, in this case, the first thing I'm going to do is reference all the elements in my Rhino environment that are B reps. So this will get everything irrespective of layer. So I'm going to reference by type. I'm also going to go and get a value list. And if I connect this to the reference by layer node from Elefront, I can just pick actual valid inputs in this case, BREP. And now I can see I have all BREPs in Rhino. Really quick and easy way to get everything. Now what I'm gonna do now is use a solid union just to join this all together into one solid object. And this is gonna close off anything inside the solid element. So if I just connect this to, to the, um, the solid union node, it's gonna take a little while. It's a pretty heavy operation, but it's effectively, oops, someone's revving on their motorbike. Um, I'm going to just join everything into one big shape and we're going to clash this against all the other elements by exploiting all its surfaces that are pointing downwards and then we're going to find out uh, what the total area of that clash is associated to each element. So it's a little bit of a complex workflow um, but definitely a powerful one. So I think it's almost done. This is really the bottleneck of the whole workflow. Once we've got this we're going to bake it into Rhino so that we don't have to keep regenerating it. So I'm going to make a layer just called um, All Solids. And what I'll do is just bake this to all solids because it should just be one big shape. Great, there we go. And I'm just going to disconnect this. At this point, I'll probably also just disable this node so that we don't have these nodes thinking um, at this point. I could also just, um, you know, connect this and, and leave it disabled. That's probably another option. Okay, so we're now going to reference by uh, layer in this case. So I'm going to reference by layer. Oh, my preview image is gone again. So it looks like my um, my guide script is bugging out. Anyway, Ugh. there we go. All right, cool. Hopefully it stays stays with me this time. I'm going to copy this value list, and I'm just going to get all solids as one object. Of course, Rhino is hiding as it likes to. I found a little bit annoying how the attention of Rhino is constantly taken away by Revit. Um, but I guess that's just the way the, the add-in works. Anyway, 
So at this point I have um, my all solids. I'm also just again gonna turn off that layer so it's not in the way visually. And what we're gonna do is deconstruct it into all its faces. So I'm gonna use the deconstruct brep component. Uh, deconstruct brep. And I'm just gonna deconstruct this thing. So that operation in Dynamo would have been incredibly slow. Um, in, in Rhino, it's instantaneous. It just happens straight away. It's pretty amazing. Um, as I go, I might just turn off these nodes. And what we're really looking at now is we want to look at the normal at the center of each face and make sure it's not pointing up because we know that doesn't need to be formed. So I'm going to use a evaluate surface node and I'm going to take each face. I'm going to reparameterize it so that we're assessing its domain of UV from one to zero, zero to one. Um, I'm going to construct a point uh, just to make, in this case, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the UV reference, which is going to be 0.5, 0.5. So just the center of each face. Um, pretty much every face is flat, so it's not that important, but sometimes if you have curved faces, it might be more relevant. So now we have the center point of each surface, but we also have the normal at that center point as well, so the outward pointing direction. What I can do now is deconstruct this as a vector. So I'm going to deconstruct vector. And I'm just going to look at its Z component. So in this case, we know that if it's pointing upwards, its, it's Z component is going to be one. If it's pointing sideways, its Z component is going to be zero and downwards negative one. So we want to just find anything that's over, over zero in principle. I'm going to go over 0.1, just in case there's any that are just pointing past sideways, but really are sideward faces, just to apply a bit of tolerance. So I'm going to say in this case, that we want to find all faces where this Z component is smaller than 0.1. I'm now just going to turn off the preview, and I'm going to, in this case, use a cull pattern to get rid of anything that doesn't meet that condition. So I'm going to take my faces, and I'm going to cull them by that condition. Now we can have a look at what we're dealing with now just using a geometry preview, or we can just bake it straight into the model. Um, I might in this case just use a custom preview, because it's easier than baking it and getting it wrong. I'm going to go to swatch input, and I'm just going to make this like roughly a, a mid-gray, just so we can sort of see what's going on. And if we have a look at what we're getting, notice now that we're not getting anything on top of our elements, and we can see that all our solid geometry is joined and voided. So this is how we can start analyzing just the outside faces of our overall geometry, ignoring anything that overlaps inside Revit. So what I can do now is just take this input, and I might just bake it to a new layer. I'm gonna make a new layer called Formwork Shell. And I'm just gonna take this input, right click it, bake, and just Say so, okay. So now these elements are in Rhino and we can use them again. So notice I'm not, I'm not always just using one big script to do everything. I do prefer to break it down into a few steps and it gives you the chance to review it along the way as well. So we're gonna move on to our final part, which is the hardest part, which is where we actually compare and analyze these, these elements. So I'm gonna make another script and I'm gonna save it. And I'm just gonna call this one demo three. So in this case, we need to reference all of our layers that contain geometry, but not our formwork shell and not all solids. Um, so in this case, I'm just gonna go back to Elefront. I'm gonna reference by layer. And in this case, I'm just gonna add a value list. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click it and I'm gonna change it to a checklist. So now we can just pick some specific layers. So I'm gonna turn off all solids. I'm gonna hold down control and I'm just gonna collect my four geometry related layers. I'm also gonna turn off my formwork shell and I might just close, no, that's okay. So we can see now that we're collecting just all of our original geometry, which is great. Um, it's gonna be at list, so I do wanna flatten it. And what we're gonna do now is take our formwork shell. So I'm gonna take another, another reference by layer. But in this case, I'm gonna get another value list and I'm just gonna leave this as a single selection, selector. Um, we're now going to get our formwork shell, which is going to be those, um, those surfaces. Now in this case, we've kept all the surfaces separate because we want to compare each surface to all the elements in our model and find out which element um, that is associated to. So I'm going to, in this case, use an area node, which will give us two really useful things that we need. One is the area of the face and the other one is the center point of the face. And we're going to clash these center points 
against our elements. And we know that in this case, the center point should only be able to really be against one element because all cojoint faces won't exist. Each face is essentially unique um, in where that center point should hit because none of them should be joined because the solid union would have got rid of those relationships. Because they're at the center as well, we know they're not gonna be sitting at the edge of faces where there could be two possible intersection candidates. Okay, so we're gonna use a collision method in this case. Um, I'm gonna be using collision one many, and we're gonna collide each point against all the elements in our list. And we're gonna use some set nodes in order to find out um, how much area overall each face contains based on the area list here. So it's a pretty complex workflow. It took a little while for me to figure it out. Sets are a lot more difficult to work with than lists I find typically, but they do have some power in them as a result. So what I'm gonna do is take my points and this step can take a little while. So I do have some patience here, but I'm gonna take my elements and I'm clashing every point against all the elements and finding out which one it hits. So it's actually pretty quick. That operation would have frozen Dynamo, no, no doubts. It would have definitely frozen Dynamo and probably crash my Revit session. So you can see the power of using Grasshopper um, instead of Dynamo in this case. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is turn on the indices of those intersections into a set. Now, sometimes you might have a negative one result, which Pythonically or in Grasshopper will actually go and get the last element in the list. I find typically this element um, actually probably occurs again in the list, and we're gonna be setting elements in sequence later on. So you can either filter out all the elements based on the negative one result, noting that you'll have to filter out both the points and also the index from this list. Um, but usually I find that it's gonna set this thing once and then twice. So usually that result's gonna be ignored uh, when we finally go and set the formwork at the end. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a set. So I'm gonna take the indices as my set. So now we have every result, which is gonna be an index as it relates to this list. But we're also gonna have multiple elements in this list sometimes. Now what I'm going to do now is use a set, mem set member node. Um, so I'll just look for member. And we're going to get the member indices. Now this is a really common workflow to group elements by key. Um, what I'm going to do is take the indices as a new set. And I'm going to graft, in this case, my, member in, my members based on those members. What I get now is I find out that these things all actually roughly belong together. In this case, I can find that, you know, obviously some elements are going to have like 75 faces, 90 faces, 5, 2, it depends. Because some of these elements have a lot of edges to them. For example, floors will have holes in them, so you can end up with quite a lot of faces that the former should be associated to. So at this point, we now have a method of associating them back to the original shape. I'm in this case just going to use a list item node. And I'm going to use, in this case, these indices back on the area list. So now I know what each of those points is represented by in terms of area. Now I can also use a list item to go and call on the respective element that those elements relate to. So from my list of elements, which I use to generate my set, I'm now going to, in this case, be just flattening this input, but I'm taking my set of indices um, to make sure that my sets and my elements are parallel. So when we go to set the data, we know that they're gonna be parallel in structure. So I should now have in this case, my reference B reps, and also in this case, uh, my items. So I can see in this case, um, I don't know if this has quite worked actually. Okay, so I made um, one mistake in this case. What I need to do is actually use the set, not the members for the, group, the, the finding out which members belong to which sets. If I do that, then this should restructure my data. In this case, um, I can see now that's the intended result. I have the equal number of lists to the number of elements I'm associating each set of those results to. So using members and sets can be a little bit complex sometimes, especially this workflow. Um, if you refer to this, literally this step here is the key to grouping elements by set index or set value. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but it's the only method I know in Grasshopper. Um, so I do recommend becoming familiar with it. Um, even I obviously need to become a bit more familiar with it, obviously. Okay, um, so now we have all these elements and we also have all these sets. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sum these lists together because these are sets of areas. So I can apply a mass addition function to them. And there we go. So now I can see that I have one list or one result per corresponding geometry above. Now what I'm gonna do is flatten this output. At the moment, the, uh, the, the values might be, they might look incorrect um, because they're currently displaying to us in square millimeters. 
I found when you go between Rhino to Revit, it seems to convert this area for us, which is really confusing. So if you make it look correct in Rhino, it actually comes into Revit wrong. Um, so just ignore it for now and we'll, va we'll visually verify how this reaches Revit later. Now, before I do anything else, I'm gonna go back to Revit. I'm gonna make a new project parameter. And I'm gonna add a something called formwork area. So I'm just gonna add this to all elements that we wanna tell them the area of in terms of how much formwork they have. It's gonna be an area parameter. We can say it can vary per group instance. And I'm gonna to wanna to apply this to walls, structural framing, structural columns and floors. Now, if I OK this, we'll see that we have a new data field that can be populated by Rhino inside to tell it how much associated formwork it contains. I'm going to go back to Rhino and Grasshopper. And at this point, we can now go and get the element ID of these elements. So using um, Elefront, I'm going to, in this case, retrieve the Rhino attributes, which will let me get the name of that object. So now I have the element ID as it corresponds to the elements below. What I'm going to do now is go and retrieve the elements using their ID. Now there's actually a new method I found in Rhino Inside which does this for us, which is great. In this case, um, the query element node just lets us provide an ID which will give us back an element. Super simple, right? So I take my name and voila, we've just converted our elements into their respective Revit element um, so we can set the values in parallel. Super simple. Um, I'm going to add a stream filter at this point because I don't want to set this constantly. I just want to do it once in one push. So in stream one, I'm going to have my Revit elements and then I'm just going to add a false start toggle. You can use a true false toggle here if you don't have the ladybug component. Um, you'll just need to remember to turn it off when you close the script. But I'll set it to true. Actually, I won't use a false start. I'll use a button. A button is better because it just sends it once. So don't just ignore that false start toggle. So now when I click on this, it will send this data across. So it only happens once, which is great. I'm now just going to re retrieve the element parameter node again, but this time I'm going to leave the value in because we're setting a parameter value. So firstly, I'm going to be just grabbing my stream filter, which is currently empty. Um, I'm going to get my values, which are the mass addition result. And I'm just going to, in this case, call on the formwork area parameter. I don't think I did an uppercase A, I'll just have to go double check that. Because case sensitivity is relevant. No, I didn't, so perfect. And at this point, we're ready to set those values. So I'm just going to plug this in. I'm going to hit the button once, and you might want to save before you do, because it could be a heavy operation, but it shouldn't take that long. I'm going to hit the button, and done. That's it. That's how quick it was. So if I go back to Revit, have a look at my floor for example, I can now see how much formwork is associated with that element. And as you can see, it's smaller than the floor's area, which we'd expect because there's overlaps with beams, columns, all sorts of elements. I can go verify it if I have a look at one element that should have the same amount of formwork as another one, such as this beam. I can see in this case I have 8.178, and if I go to the beam next door, the same value. So it's looking pretty good. It's looking like it's set the true and correct formed area um, we can see 10.98, 10.98. I'm pretty happy with this result. I think it's pretty much correct. Um, and in this case, it's something you really couldn't do easily with Dynamo. So we can see for the most part, it's looking, it's looking good. We can see this one's got um, a slightly different area to this one, which makes sense because there's no, there's no beam intersection here, but there is in this case. So um, there we go, a really powerful workflow. Of course, you can schedule um, totals as well. So if I go to schedules and quantities, Let's look at maybe our structural framing, for example. I can add my formwork area parameter. I can also add the reference level of these beams. And in this case, I'll just say sorting and grouping, we're gonna sort by reference level. I'm gonna turn off itemize every instance, and I'm just gonna tell my formwork area to calculate totals. And we can see per floor, per set of beams, what's our area of formwork required? Um, it really quickly in a quick tally. Um, so it's pretty strong, pretty powerful. And this technique can obviously be refined if you want to um, be more detailed in how you associate types of formwork. Maybe you, your boards that lie horizontally have a different rate associated to them to the ones that are set vertically. So you might break up your, your data by vertical formwork and horizontal formwork. But this is a much more robust method than the one I showed before and I hope was really useful as well. So hopefully this was a helpful workflow overall, um, far more efficient, uh, both geometrically and time-wise, 
than Dynamo. So I think it's definitely a superior workflow, um, really helpful for some structural engineers trying to figure out how much form works associated to their elements. Um, I actually had some requests for this from a few users. So I really hope that this technique is interesting for you and shows you a different approach um, and also shows you that sometimes going outside Revit and Dynamo is necessary to get good results. Anyway, um, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.